and ladies and gentlemen, the Singapore Maritime Week 2022 opening ceremony will now begin. Hello there, very good morning to all of you. It's great to see your faces in this room. But first of all, please allow me to acknowledge this morning we have with us Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies. Good to have you. With Mr. Assis Warren, Minister for Transport and Minister in Charge of Trade Relations. Good morning. We have Mr. Chi Hong Tat, Senior Minister of State for Ministry of Transport. Good to have you. And Mr. Long Ai Singh, Permanent Secretary for Ministry of Transport. As well as all of you, our distinguished guests, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, a very, very warm welcome to the 16th edition of the Singapore Maritime Week. Now, thank you all for gracing this event with your presence and time. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Carissa Seat. It is an honor to be your MC on this momentous occasion. Now, SMW is an annual gathering of the international maritime community to advance key industry issues and to exchange ideas to bring this sector forward. Now, driven by the Maritime and Port Authority, MPA, in collaboration with industry stakeholders, as well as research and educational institutions, SMW brings together key opinion leaders and industry leaders through conferences, dialogues, as well as forums. I'm also very pleased to announce and share with you that we are concurrently joined this morning by many international attendees that are on the Singapore Maritime Week's virtual platform. So you can choose to network and gain diverse perspectives by connecting with them via the SMW virtual platform. To log in, you can refer to your confirmation email that you received for this event. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now pleased to invite on stage for the opening address. Please put your hands together for Minister for Transport, Mr. S. S. Warren. Minister S. Warren, please. Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet, my colleague, Senior Minister of State, Chi Hong Tat, Your Excellencies, members of the industry, my colleagues from the Maritime Port Authority and the Ministry of Transport, and ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. First, let me say it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here in person and also joining us virtually for the opening ceremony of the Singapore Maritime Week 2022. I want to extend first our deep appreciation to DPM Heng for accepting our invitation to be, deliver the keynote address, and also a warm welcome to all our speakers and guests and the more than 10,000 participants that the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore expects at this week's event. This is uh, the nature and scale of this event, quite unimaginable even as recently as a few months back. So it's a real pleasure and I'm delighted to see all of you. As we know, the maritime sector is central to international trade and the global economy, accounting for over 80% of international movement of goods. It keeps global supply chains moving. This was especially evident at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when sea freight became even more important due to the sharp decline in air freight capacity. We are now seeing the green shoots of a post-pandemic recovery. Global trade reached a record high in 2021, increasing by about 13% in value from 2019. But the pandemic and geopolitical developments have disrupted supply chains, and they have left a profound and lasting impact. Value chains are becoming more flexible and regional, as countries and companies increasingly rebalance production to adopt a blend of just-in-time and just-in-case models. In tandem, the maritime sector is facing other challenges and constraints, 
in terms of capacity, manpower, and carbon emissions. Taken together, these forces herald a sea change for the maritime industry. All stakeholders, from companies to governments, must respond decisively to ensure the maritime sector's reliability, resilience, and readiness for the future. And it calls for nothing less than the transformation of the industry. So this year's Maritime Week is, Singapore Maritime Week is aptly themed transformation for growth. And indeed, we will hear much more about this from DPN Heng in his speech. But if I may share, this transformation must encompass three essential elements. Continuous innovation, boundaryless collaboration, and strong talent development. First, continuous innovation, which is key to attaining new heights in performance and capabilities. If you take the example of Singapore's Tuas port, it is expected to be the world's largest fully automated container terminal when completed in the 2040s, with a handling capacity of 65 million TEUs. It will deliver a quantum change in efficiency and sustainability by deploying state-of-the-art equipment like automated double trolley electric key cranes, driverless automated guided vehicles, and automated yard cranes supported by a network of optical cameras and laser sensors. PSA continues to push the technological frontier further, developing video analytics and robotics-based solutions to reduce manual labor for coning and deconing operations at the wharf site. Our innovation efforts extend beyond the port to the wider maritime ecosystem. The most recent Smart Port Challenge in 2021 saw over 150 global startups submit their solutions to address challenges faced by the industry. WeVair was the winner with a solution that tapped on technology to monitor, aggregate, and standardize data across multiple sources to provide a comprehensive risk analysis and decision support system. This will enable more accurate risk assessments and simplify the insurance claims management processes in the maritime ecosystem. Continuous innovation will enable us to harness these and other technologies, such as maritime autonomous ships, additive manufacturing, and blockchain for supply chain resilience, as well as drones for the efficient transport of supplies in order to transform the industry. Secondly, boundaryless collaboration. An enduring lesson from COVID-19 is how intricately interconnected we are as a global community. It is only by collaborating across boundaries that we can address the common challenges that confront the maritime industry. The International Maritime Organization plays a central role in this endeavor. It sets the standards for the global maritime industry and creates the universal regulatory framework for safe, secure, and efficient shipping. Singapore actively supports the IMO by contributing to its governance as a council member, as well as initiatives to address the challenges and opportunities in international shipping. We have complemented the IMO's global efforts with regional initiatives. For instance, Singapore is a founding member of the Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia, or RECAP for short. We have hosted RECAP's Information Sharing Centre since its inception in 2006. The Information Sharing Centre works with the 21 member countries to disseminate information and advisories to the maritime community in a timely manner thereby improving the security and safety of the waters in Asia. With the support of the IMO, the success of RECAP has inspired other regions to establish similar arrangements. Looking ahead, decarbonization is a major challenge for the maritime industry. And we must act today and together. As a global maritime hub, Singapore seeks to contribute to this critical effort in a flexible, 
and inclusive way. At the multilateral level, we have been staunch, a staunch supporter and advocate of IMO-led initiatives, such as the NextGen web portal, which was launched with Singapore in September last year. The portal compiles and shares maritime decarbonization initiatives from across the world, paving the way for collaboration and capacity building across the public and private sectors to meet the IMO's targets to reduce carbon intensity of international shipping by at least 40% by 2030, and at least half total greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, both from 2008 levels. Since its launch, the portal has hosted projects with more than 500 partners. And at the plurilateral level, we support initiatives among like-minded partners that seek to galvanize action towards more ambitious outcomes. One example is the Clyde Mag Declaration, which was launched by the United Kingdom at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change's 26th Conference of Parties, or COP26, in November last year. It aims to establish green shipping corridors between ports by deploying zero emission vessel technologies on voyages or alternative fuel and charging infrastructure in ports. And in this regard, I am pleased to announce that Singapore will join the Clyde Bank Declaration for Green Shipping Corridors together with 22 other signatory states. But ultimately, decarbonization must be a whole of industry effort. Efforts at the company and industry level are just as important as government-led initiatives. The Castor Consortium, Itochu Corporation and Sumitomo are leading various initiatives to develop alternative fuel ships. Singapore welcomes such industry-led collaborations to leverage our maritime hub ecosystem to pilot and deploy green solutions. Decarbonization is but one of the myriad challenges that lie ahead. We need our combined capabilities across nations and importantly from both the public and private sectors to chart a path forward for the maritime sector. As part of Singapore's contribution to such partnership and discourse, the Ministry of Transport and the Maritime Port Authority have established a Maritime International Advisory Panel. The panel comprises 12 cross-sector global business leaders with diverse perspectives on key trends shaping the maritime industry and how the maritime sector and adjacent industries can collaborate to enhance the connectivity and resilience of global supply chains. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to the IAP members who are with us today and we look forward to fruitful discussions over the next two days. And the IAP's deliberations will complement our ongoing discussions with the industry so that we can formulate a robust, resilient strategy for our maritime sector. Finally, strong talent development underpins the transformation of the maritime industry. Over the centuries, as maritime technology has evolved, Seafarers around the world have adapted, learned new skills, and honed their craft. In short, the maritime sector and its workforce are no strangers to transformation, and it is no different today. As the maritime industry pushes ahead with transformation, the nature of the jobs will change radically. Our goal is to build a maritime workforce that is future-ready and well endowed with the skills to meet the new demands of the industry. And this must be a joint effort bringing together governments, industry, unions, and educators. It is in this spirit that Maritime Singapore is stepping up efforts to attract and nurture talent. Besides scholarships and awards to attract talent and develop locals for seafaring careers, the Tripartite Partners recently launched a new initiative to support the skills development of local seafarers, SAIL Milestone Achievement Program, SAIL MAP. Seafarers undergo a rigorous training program which involves seagoing journeys and onshore assessments. And in turn, and importantly, seafarers receive financial incentives when they attain key career milestones. 
This will support their income when they are not sailing and are building up their seafaring skills and knowledge. At the same time, we need to enable existing maritime workers and mid-career switchers to acquire skills in emerging areas such as digitalization and sustainability and take on new or expanded roles. Our career conversion programs help mid-career workers from various backgrounds take up new roles in the sea transport sector. And since 2018, over 200 mid-career workers have undergone skills training. And even as we nurture our homegrown talent, Maritime Singapore will remain open to talent from abroad. It is only by having a judicious blend of local and foreign workers that we can secure the competitiveness of our maritime sector, attract more investments, and ultimately create more jobs. So to conclude, to succeed in the transformation of the maritime sector, we believe we must focus on the essential elements of continuous innovation, boundaryless collaboration, and strong talent development. This endeavor requires partnerships across countries and certainly between the public and private sectors. And we hope that the Maritime, Singapore Maritime Week can serve as a valuable platform for that. I would like to thank all the speakers, panelists, and guests for joining us. And I would like to wish all participants a productive week ahead as we gain insights, engage in discussions, and strengthen partnerships at the Singapore Maritime Week. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Minister Warren. Please remain on stage as our ushers take you to the centre stage for the next segment, our launch ceremony. Now to join us here on stage for the launch of the 16th edition of the Singapore Maritime Week, I'm pleased to invite Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat to join us. Along with him, we have Senior Minister of State, Mr. Chi Hong Tat, to join us as well. Next, I'd like to invite Chief Executive of Maritime and Port Authority, Ms. Kwa Le Hoon. Please join us, Ms. Kwa. I'll next like to invite President of Singapore Shipping Association, Ms. Caroline Young, to join us on stage. I'd like to call upon Chairman of the Singapore Maritime Foundation, Mr. Hall Wang Yu, to join us. And next, our President of Association of Singapore Marine Industries, Mr. Simon Quick, to join us on stage. Now, in appreciation of our frontliners who have worked tirelessly to keep our supply chains going, I'd also like to invite the following up on stage. First, President of Port Officers Union, Mr. Benjamin Tang, join us. I'd like to call upon President of the Singapore Organization of Seamen, Mr. Kam Soon Wat, to join us as well. I'd like to invite the General Secretary of Singapore Maritime Officers Union, Ms. Mary Liu, please come on stage. And finally, Acting President of Singapore Port Workers Union, please welcome Mr. Pua Tiong Kun. Wonderful. It is quite a reunion and glad to have everyone with us here on stage. We will have our mask on throughout this entire segment here. Now, um, at this point, here's a quick briefing on how we're going to do this, right? Um, we are all, audience, together with me, going to do a countdown. And at the end of the countdown, our VIPs in front of the pedestal will then launch the button to signify the launch of the SMW 2022. So if you don't count, they don't launch. 
I'm just joking. They will launch. Okay? And for our VIPs in front of the pedestal, just gently place your right hand uh, on the button without pressing it. And only at the end of the countdown, you will then trigger the button. Shall we do that? Please step forward and just place your right hand on the button. This is great for a photo moment as well. Look at our photographers. They're all waiting. <laughs> Big smiles. Okay. So audience, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready, yes? Let's do the countdown together, starting from three, two, one. Please, trigger the button. Here we go, a round of applause. SMW 2022 is launched. There we have it. If you like, please applaud. An exciting week ahead to all our VIPs. We will now be taking a group photo. I'd like to invite our VIPs on the second row to just step forward to join us for a large group photo. That's right. Keep your mask on at this point. And to look ahead at our photographers. We've all learned to smile with our eyes. So that's a new skill set. Looking great. Thank you very much to our VIPs. I have a good feeling. Now you'll be exiting on the right hand side of the stage. Our ashes will show you the way, please as you make your way slowly down and back to your seats to enjoy the rest of this program this morning. We certainly appreciate your patience and your presence actually this morning to launch the 16th edition of the Singapore Maritime Week. Now, as you know, the theme is transformation for growth and the stage is transforming as I speak. Now, here's a bit about the week ahead, okay? There'll be a range of activities and events that are organized by MPA, our industry um, stakeholders, research and educational institutions as well. And um, the cosmopolitan profile of our participants will indeed reflect the vibrancy and diversity of Singapore as a global hub point and leading international maritime center. There'll be lots of exciting programs that are happening this week week. If you haven't had the chance, you can scan the back of your name badges for the QR code to check out the program or access um, our website at www.smw.sg. And now, as we wait for the stage to get itself in place, in just a while, we will be preparing for the keynote address. And indeed, it does take a team to get things going and working in these extraordinary times. But as you can see, quality is not compromised in any way. No details are put in to ensure that our speakers will have a comfortable time in just a while. As we prepare the stage, after the keynote address, we will be having a 30 minutes fireside chat. 
And this is a great opportunity for all of you to participate as well. It will be interactive. Oh, um, for this part, um, not yet, but in the later part, we will have an interactive segment where you can put in your questions and you can join us um, in the panel discussion. All right, we are all set and we are ready, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience. It is now my pleasure to invite on stage Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, to come on stage for his keynote address. TPM Heng, please. Minister S. Iswaran, SMS Chi Hong Tat, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you who are here and those of you who are online. Thank you for inviting me to deliver this lecture at the opening of the Singapore Maritime Week. I last spoke to some of you at the Global Maritime Forum towards the end of 2019, but that occasion seems like a lifetime away. The seas were already choppy then. The global trading system was under stress from trade frictions. The sector was grappling with overcapacity while having to make additional investments to comply with IMO 2020 sulfur emissions cap. None of us could have expected the COVID-19 storm that would hit us. The pandemic turned the world upside down, the world we knew upside down, and precipitated the largest economic crisis in a century. Thankfully, the maritime sector persevered, continuing to move goods and essential supplies around the world, keeping the world economy going. Just as we were hoping to exit the storm with the receding of the Omicron wave, another one struck, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The dark clouds are only just gathering. The Ukraine crisis will put the brakes on global recovery. Oil prices are at an all-time high, adding pressure to global inflation and increasing the risk of stagflation. With the silver airspace over Ukraine closed, some flights have been cancelled, while those still operating are taking longer routes. Companies are also avoiding the China-Europe rail lines, which run through Russia. The reduced and rail cargo capacity and the resulting higher costs have put a greater strain on shipping. The armed conflict has also disrupted shipping directly. More than 100 ships are stuck in the ports in the Black Sea, with several damaged due to the conflict. With Russia and Ukraine accounting for 15% of the global seafaring workforce, there could potentially be manpower disruptions to the maritime sector. Even if military action in Ukraine ceases, the invasion has irreversibly accelerated the tectonic shifts in geopolitics. So, it is in this context that we are gathering today, with one storm receding behind us and a new one clouding the horizon. In this stormy seas, there are many preoccupations and urgent tasks to deal with. But one key reason to be optimistic is that the fundamentals of the shipping industry remain strong. The fundamentals of the shipping industry remain strong. Shipping remains the most cost and carbon efficient mode of transportation. Despite the pandemic, global trade hit a record high last year, with over 80% of the trade volume carried by sea. Despite the current uncertainty, the medium term outlook for the global maritime industry is good. But to realize this potential, we must deal with the challenges and opportunities. So the theme of this year's Singapore Maritime Week Transformation for Growth is most appropriate. So in this spirit, let me suggest three areas of transformation that the sector must focus on. And I'll illustrate each with a statistic. The first statistic is that the global container shipping rates increased more than four times in 2021 compared to pre-COVID-19 level. The storm has lifted the maritime industry, providing much-needed reprieve after the struggle for profitability in recent years. In the near term, this is positive for ports and shipping lines. But this will not last, 
and we should not expect it to. Presently high rates, persistently high rates will dampen trade and undermine the lifeblood of the global economy. Shipping capacity is stretched now. New capacity is coming on stream over the next few years. Herein lies the risk that excessive investment in shipbuilding now could eventually lead to another capacity glut, which we saw after the global financial crisis. The shipping industry is, a highly, cyclical, is highly cyclical, prone to boom and bust. Large swings in shipping rates not only create huge uncertainty for trade and economies, but is also disruptive for attracting and growing the maritime sector. It is inherently difficult to eliminate economic cycles of all forms, including the shipping cycle. But we can moderate the cycle by having greater awareness of this risk and working together to adopt a discipline of measured and continuous investment. The second statistic is that on average in 2021, the reliability of vessels arriving at ports on time has more than halved to around 35% from around 78% before the pandemic. So down from 78% to 35%. This is partly due to the disruptions to manpower and logistics brought on by COVID-19 and lower investments in capacities in the down cycle years. But stripping away the cyclical and COVID effects, the statistics also shines the spotlight on the potential for us to significantly improve the efficiency of entire supply chains and capacity to adapt to evolving circumstances. There's even greater impetus to do so as the maritime industry will need to adjust to the reconfiguration of global trade flows and supply chains. The major enabler is digitalization. Digitalization can enable the better tracking and optimization of the flow of goods. Going digital can also reduce the voluminous paperwork, which often requires the same information fields. The third statistic is that the maritime sector has to reduce absolute greenhouse gas emission by 50% by 2050, compared to 2008 levels. If the last two years seemed like a lifetime, 30 years may seem like eternity. But in the maritime industry, this is not that distant the future because 30 years is only one ship generation away. The global maritime industry should build on the strong momentum of IMO 2020 to further accelerate your transition to a greener future. Some had earlier touted IMO 2020 as a Y2K of shipping. But I'm glad that the industry managed to make a seamless transition to using very low sulfur fuel oil. There are so many promising innovations that can reduce carbon emissions, and there is no better time than now to accelerate your transition to a greener future. Continuous maritime investment, digitalization for efficiency, decisive green transition. These are three key areas that the global maritime industry must focus on. As a global maritime hub, Singapore seeks to contribute to these transformation efforts. Let me elaborate. The first area is on continuous maritime investment. In Singapore, we are fortunate to have a close-knit maritime community. As a very small island state, the entire nation is like an extended port and international maritime centre all integrated into one. As part of a nationwide economic transformation effort, we launched a sea transport industry transformation map in 2018, bringing together all the stakeholders in the maritime community to effect change. You have just heard from Minister Iswaran about the three essentials of transformation for the sector. Indeed, this collective approach has made good progress in the past five years with good productivity growth and increase in the number of good jobs and stronger linkages and synergies across the economy. We are seeing the fruits of industry transformation through innovation and the use of technology, such as in advanced manufacturing. For example, Wilhelmsen and Tusen Krupp set up a joint venture in Singapore to provide 3D printed parts for vessel maintenance. 
the JV has printed and delivered more than 800 replacement parts to date. Today, I'm happy to announce the launch of the Refresh Sea Transport Industry Transformation Map for 2025, which sets out the collective cost for the next few years with an emphasis on innovation, human capital development, and resilience. Our key ambitions include developing Tuas Port into the largest fully automated container terminal port in the world, expanding the International Maritime Center ecosystem here, nurturing the maritime, marine tech startup ecosystem, and creating 1,000 additional good local jobs. To strengthen the translation from ideas to action, we'll be setting up a Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee, comprising our businesses, unions, and government agencies to oversee implementation. The second area is digitalization. In 2019, I launched Digital Port at SG as a maritime single window for the clearance of vessels and crew entering Singapore. Since then, Digital Port has saved 100,000 man hours each year in Singapore. But given the global nature of trade, right from the start, we aimed for this digitalization initiative to be operable across the world to enable industry players to reap greater efficiency. In 2020, we went beyond digital port to embark on digital oceans, an initiative to harmonize data standards to achieve ship port data exchange interoperability. PSA International and five other international partners are working together on this project, and we welcome more to come on board. This morning, we are taking this digitalization effort one step further with the development of Oceans X. Oceans X is an API marketplace to facilitate data exchange that will enable us to scale digitalization more easily and quickly. When two parties seek to link their systems for data sharing, an API will need to be developed. Each time an additional party joins, a new API is potentially needed. This approach is not only onerous, but the proliferation of APIs adds to the complexity of systems over time. With the Ocean's X API marketplace, parties can search through the list of standard APIs for maritime data sets to see whether an existing one meets their needs, in which case there is no necessity to develop a new one. Streamlining the APIs used will further improve efficiency. For example, the Port Clearance API, which companies can use to directly link their systems to digital port, can save up to 100,000 additional man hours of processing time annually on top of the savings already achieved. Beyond port clearances, Ocean's X can further strengthen digital connectivity between port authorities, terminal operators, shipping lines, logistics service providers, and government agencies as well as other digital ecosystems, such as SG Tradex. This digital backbone can in turn accelerate innovation in marine tech and other areas. So I welcome all of you to join us in this digitalization effort. The third area is in making a decisive green transition. We launched the Maritime Singapore Decarbonisation Blueprint last month. It has ambitious goals, which include making our ports net zero and reducing harbour craft emissions significantly by 2050. The blueprint was developed after in-depth consultations with industry and recognises the need to green every segment of the supply chain, from our vessels to our ports and marine bunkering infrastructure. While the maritime green transition is a global effort, Singapore seeks to make a contribution. For example, we set up the Global Maritime Centre for Decarbonisation, bringing together industry players, industry partners, researchers and MPA to drive R&D and to pilot novel decarbonisation solutions. The founding of the centre was made possible through an initial $120 million contribution from governments and six like-minded industry partners. A second example 
is the Coastal Sustainability Alliance, a partnership to support the electrification of Singapore's harbour crafts by jointly investing in a network of charging points for electric boats. Yet another example is a Clydeside Declaration for Green Shipping Containers, Green Shipping Corridors. So Minister Iswaran earlier announced that Singapore will be joining this initiative together with 22 other signatory states. We are, so we are only 30 years or one ship generation away from the global maritime emissions target set by IMO. With more than 100,000 merchant vessels flying our seas today, many will have to be replaced in the coming decades. Likewise, significant complementary changes on the port side infrastructure will be needed. As a global financial centre, some 20 international banks based here have ship finance portfolios. Singapore also has a pool of venture capital, private equity and alternative investment players here. We are looking to build a green ship financing ecosystem and to develop a suite of financing options to enable the green transition. In the coming years, the maritime sector will also need to undergo a fuel transition from today's marine fuels to cleaner fuels. Singapore, Japan and the Port of Rotterdam Authority have also formed the Future Fuel Port Network to develop a roadmap on the adoption of cleaner marine fuels. We are also a member of the Castor Initiative, a multinational coalition across the entire maritime ecosystem that aims to design, build and commission the world's first ammonia fueled tanker by 2025. I welcome all of you to work with us on this journey towards a greener future. So let me conclude. Although the global maritime industry is cyclical and facing challenges, we are approaching the future from a position of strength. The fundamentals for growth in the medium term are strong, despite the short-term headwinds. We must make the best use of this time and of this strength to transform if we are to realize the growth potential. The industry will need to focus on three critical areas of transformation. Continuous investments to mitigate the highly cyclical nature of the industry. Digitalization to improve the efficiency and adaptive capacity of the supply chain. And making a decisive green transition. Given the global nature of the maritime industry, the maritime community should work together to address these issues. Singapore will do our part to contribute to the global efforts. I thank our international partners for your continued support, and we look forward to working with you to transform our sea transport sector and strengthen the global maritime commons. On this note, I wish you an enriching conference ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, DPM Hank, for that keynote address. Please stay with us on stage. Our Asha will show you to the chair as we prepare for our next segment, which is the fireside chat. Now, this juncture, in just a while, as um, DPM Heng makes his way, now this segment will be, they're allowed to have their mask off, so we'll give him a moment to settle in. And I'd like to invite um, Chief Executive Officer of Pacific Carriers Limited and Chairman of Singapore Maritime Foundation, Mr. Ho Wing Yu, to join us here on stage. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, DPM. DPM, there was an excellent maritime lecture. And uh, I know you have limited time with us, so I'm going to dive into my first question. You earlier highlighted that uh, sea transport is crucial to the world economy. And uh, what we are seeing today is a very uncertain economic outlook, clouded by geopolitical risk and a rather fragile post-COVID recovery. So the question I have, uh, DPM, uh, are these disruptions sort of transient bumps on the road? Or are we actually looking at something perhaps more fundamental, or more structural to global trade patterns? And I'm particularly referring to the significant geopolitical shifts 
that's going around uh, with the you know our, the four major superpowers, the US, China, EU, and Russia, and the impact particularly on uh, food security and energy security. Well, uh, Mingyu, thank you for your question. That's a very uh, deep question and a very wide question. So first, let me say that um, we, if you look back over the last 20 odd years, uh, the world has gone from one crisis to another. In, in the 1997-98, we had the Asian financial crisis. In the 2001, we had the dot-com bubble. In 2006, we had a global financial crisis. And now you have a COVID crisis. So I think to, we must expect crisis as a recurring feature of the global economy and these disruptions. This is on top of the usual economic cycles you know, of ups and downs. So we mentioned, I mentioned about the shipping cycle earlier. There will be such cycles. So I think the, the need for us to be prepared for crisis and to uh, build resilience into our system is going to be very important. And in the last few, you know, last one odd year since the COVID pandemic, you'll find that in addition to geopolitical risks, the, the risk of a pandemic that is so disruptive that brought the global economy to the worst recession in a century is again something that uh, was not anticipated. But I must say that the global economy has reacted reasonably well. And I mentioned that the shipping industry in particular, the maritime industry, has really been a star performer keeping the global economy uh, growing. So I would say that in good times, we need to think about building resilience into our system. And so you have mentioned a number of uh, key risks that have coming up. The COVID-19 is one of them. Before COVID-19, the US-China trade tensions was already growing uh, significantly. And uh, the Ukraine uh, crisis will, has a very direct impact on certainly energy, because Russia is a very, very major player. You will lead to rethinking about uh, energy security in Europe and around the world. And at the same time, the food, uh, Russia and Ukraine account for about 25% of the global wheat export. So people are going to take food security seriously. So food security, energy security are going to be issues which every country will need to address. So in the coming years, I think you're going to see a greater need for people to both prepare for a more resilient uh, chain, but at the same time to provides for some form of insurance to make sure that you don't have a disruption that could totally disrupt the entire economy. So how do we deal with this uh, set of challenges? I'll say first and foremost, Singapore, for Singapore itself, we are a very tiny nation state, right? but we are a very, very strong believer in multilateralism. And that is why uh, when the WTO round was launched, we were uh, inside Minister Giorgio at that time was a very uh, key player in helping to launch of the Doha round. But the Doha trade round that sets the six to set out trade rules across the world has not made much progress. So what we've done is we started uh, negotiating free trade agreements, a series of free trade agreements, first bilaterally and then across the whole of ASEAN. And then uh, now the the latest, one of the latest is the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So I think it is important for countries that are like-minded, that believe in globalization, to work together to secure this framework for uh, global trade. Because I personally believe that the evidence is very clear, that economic integration provides uh, for a better way for us to uplift our standard of living, and that it also allows us to grow together with the world. And in that regard, I think there's still a lot of potential for global growth. I strongly support the UN Sustainable Development Goal because despite all the global economic growth, there are still many nations, particularly you know, in Africa, which requires uh, support. And I think integrating these other economies into the global economy much better will help to uplift uh, many of these people. Now, Within the region, we are fortunate that we have a very great, good trade agreement with ASEAN, so ASEAN, the Free Trade Area, ASEAN Economic Community. I was personally very involved in negotiating those uh, quite a few years back. 
And I think it has been a good agreement that benefits ASEAN. ASEAN itself is 600 over million people, and it is, uh, there's a growing middle class. And I expect ASEAN trade uh, within ASEAN and across with the major partners will grow very strongly. So trade agreement is one area. And the other is, um, I think the whole uh, financing network that we can develop, that if we can grow finance, I mentioned about the green finance and so on, but there are also many other areas. And doing the, this whole digitalization trend uh, will be important. So it is important for us to, I believe countries need to have this belief that economic competition is not a zero-sum game. In fact, it is a spur to greater improvement. But for countries to benefit from this integration, you need to restructure the economy. And that is why I think this theme of transformation is important. Uh, we, are, we need to learn how to use resources much, much more efficiently, uh, in particular resources with a constraints, you know, like your carbon constraints. So whether it's energy, uh, and, uh, so the more efficient we can be. And I believe that the coming uh, Industry 4.0 uh, digitalization trend is going to transform every sector in the, of the global economy. And we must write on this. And if we can, we can make a successful transition. A, a transition that involves digitalization, a transition involving going green. Thank you, DPM. Uh, building resilience, is what I'm hearing from you, DPM, as well as also continuously adapt to global risk and seek opportunities. So, DPM, perhaps um, a related question will be, you know, um, what do you see are the real opportunities and silver linings for Singapore? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I'm an optimist. I, I like to uh, work on things which are, are possible. So I'll say that, you know, Singapore is a very small economy. It doesn't threaten anybody. We would like to be friends with all. So our opportunities will be first and foremost, you know, since this is a trade about, this is a Singapore Maritime Week. We have been a very major maritime uh, center, uh, global maritime center for, for many, many years now. And I would say that the maritime sector is clearly one great opportunity. I mentioned that, you know, despite the pandemic, despite all the disruptions that are going on, actually global maritime trade increased. It has been very difficult for everyone I know because uh, whether it's disruptions in the ship, disruption in the port, and the poor seafarers having to stay on board for a long time now. Uh, so I think the, but the, the maritime industry has proven its resilience. And as I said, you know, the maritime uh, sea transport is the most carbon efficient, you know, most energy efficient, most carbon efficient. So we should build on that. But at the same time, uh, the other major area that we are working on is this whole industry transformation. And there, I would just point out two things. One, the impact of uh, technology and innovation. I, I firmly believe that digitalization and the new technologies will be very significant. So if you're not prepared for it, you'll say it's a disruptive technology because it disrupts my operation. But if you are able to write on this, it's going to catapult you into a very different position. So we must invest in uh, technology and innovation. So on Singapore's part, uh, we, are, we are devoting 25 billion Singapore dollars between now and 2025 to invest in uh, R&D, to invest in our universities, in our polytechnics, to invest in centers of innovation, to work with companies in this transformation. So I very much look forward to that. And the other area is really that one major reason why you have such a global pushback against globalization is that the interests of workers have not been taken care of. So if workers feel that, well, yes, the economy has grown, but you know, all you uh, rich businessmen have become richer and uh, inequality is growing, what is in it for me? Now, fortunately, uh, the same debate took place in the very early years of Singapore's independence. But uh, you know, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our founding prime minister, forged a very good relationship with our workers, with our unions, and this tripartite framework that we have been having have been an extremely strong one. Earlier on during the launch of the ITM, I'm very happy to see uh, Sister Mary Liu from NTUC and her colleagues from the Port Workers Union. We need to, in our transformation effort, we must bring our workers along 
so that they can master the latest skills, uh, technology, and move up the value chain. And uh, I think Singapore's education system has been reasonably good, and I believe that the next phase of our transformation is adult education, workers' education. Thank you, DPM. Very happy to hear the maritime industry you know, continue relevance and importance for Singapore. And um, you know, all of us in this room are working very hard to make sure that we continue to stay relevant and transform, absolutely. Which leads me to my next question, which is sustainability, which is nowadays a must-have. So DPM, um, amidst all this you know, uh, cloudy uh, 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 landscape of geopolitical inflationary risk, it's also clear that we must press on in the field of sustainability. And this could be a potential sweet spot here. So my question is that, how can Singapore play a catalytic role in making a decisive green transition, as you mentioned in your speech, uh, DPM? For example, does Singapore have the ambition to play and lead at the global level, working with uh, intergovernmental organizations, commercial international bodies, to set standards, for example? Well, Wingyu, I think that's a very important question. So first, I must say that Singapore takes the green... Uh, takes climate change seriously. We are low-lying island states. If sea level rises a lot more, we'll be completely wiped out. So it's an existential threat to Singapore. Uh, therefore, uh, we have actually announced that we'll be setting aside at least $100 billion to build up our coastal defences. In fact, I personally went to the Netherlands to see how they build polders, and we are trying out some of this. So we take it very seriously. And I believe that uh, MPA and our uh, Ministry of Transport uh, colleagues have been together with the shipping industry, have been working hard on this. So that's why we, we must make a... And I'm glad that IMO has set up a 2050 target to, it, to reduce the emission by at least 50%. So what are the few things that we can do and that we should be doing? One is that we should attract you know, uh, and welcome global players here to answer the big questions of what needs to be done, how do we test bed solutions, how do we scale the solutions, so last month, I mentioned we launched the Maritime Singapore Decarbonisation Blueprint 2050. So this sets out the, our strategies for uh, sustainable maritime Singapore. The other, you mentioned about leading global standards. So we are uh, hoping to push the frontiers and uh, we have launched the LNG bunkering standards. They will provide a clear framework, regulatory framework for, conduct, for the conduct of LNG bunkering in Singapore. And we also look forward to working with others to set regulations and technical standards for ammonia uh, bunkering. Now, the second area which I mentioned earlier is really on R&D, and I mentioned the $25 billion that we devoted to it. Uh, one key, uh, two areas which directly affect all of you here is one on sustainability and another on the maritime transformation. Because uh, the, there are a lot of scope for transformation of the maritime sector. So how do we innovate in, in this regard? And whether it is, uh, I mentioned about 3D, you know, 3D printing in my speech. So we have a National Research Foundation and our Agency for Science and Tech, at which we will be happy to work with everyone. In fact, they've been working on this, pushing on 3D uh, printing, digital twins, and so on. So any system that is much more efficient will also be much more carbon efficient. And the third is on the green financing. Singapore is a major financing hub, uh, and that I think green financing has a lot of opportunities. Well, we must mobilize capital of all forms, be it a venture fund, private equity, alternative investments, and the banks itself, for to set the standards for a green transition. And in fact, I recently discussed with a, a banker from Germany, who was very keen to do more in Singapore on this uh, whole subject of green financing. And the MAS does have a very good plan to look at how we can develop green financing as part of our longer-term future for the world. Yeah. Thank you, DPM. Yeah. Um, I heard that you, you used the term decisive, yeah. which very much uh, signal and emphasize the intent and the resolve for green transition. Very happy to hear that. And I'm sure many of us in the room absolutely agree with the resolve. And, um, and the idea that the collaboration and the daring to innovate are key to green transition. 
Which brings me to my point that, you know, for us to accelerate the collaboration is leadership. And what I'm hearing from UDPM is the government is working to engage and facilitate a lot of joint actions, AFAs. So that's very, very good for the industry. And also hear from you, your, your point about green financing, so that we're able to bring our green ambitions to life. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, DPM, I'm going to go on to my final and third question, which is around people and talent. It's a question that is close to the hearts and minds of everybody. DPM, you mentioned this just now. I recall that you mentioned this in the uh, SBF APEC Summit a couple of uh, weeks ago. I also heard Minister Iswaran mentioned this as well. And my question is really around, you know, we are, we are in, in, in a, an environment where it's increasingly compressed change cycle and our ability to see the risk, seize the opportunities, as you said, is absolutely crucial. And as a CEO myself, uh, a key enabler of this is talent, as talent is in the heart of, you know, of all transformation. So as a global maritime business, I'd like to seek your thoughts on what you see is the future of work and what are the future skills that Singaporeans would need to not just cope, but really thrive in this landscape. Well, Wingy, I think that's a very important question. So I would say, uh, let, let me answer it in, in two parts. One is the first, the future of uh, work depends very much on the future of the maritime industry. And I think there is a very bright future for the maritime industry. But that future is a future that needs a lot of effort to transform. And where does the transformation, where would the transformation lead to? I think a, a greener maritime industry, a more digitalized maritime industry, and uh, a much more connected maritime industry will be important. And in that regard, therefore, I think the workflow is going to change uh, significantly. Because that's on, on the demand side, I think there will be all this demand. On the supply side, the major uh, technological change, one major change that is coming is Industry 4.0. The importance in how the whole digitalization movement, AI, machine learning, autonomy, autonomous vehicles, and so on, will be coming on stream and getting better in the coming years. So in that regard, we've got to rethink what the work will be like on board and on the ship, across the ship uh, and at the port area. And in that regard, I would say that um, all this work will have to change. Uh, the, we will have to reconfigure the processes and uh, eliminate as many of those unproductive work as possible. I mentioned about the data exchange, and that data exchange is, you know, it doesn't make sense to have humans inputting all those data over and over, over again when you can have thousands of man hours of saving across the world to do that. But to do that, you will need new, that calls for new skills. So the transformation will have to start from the industry, from the leaders sitting here, as to how you see your job, your operations changing, and then redesigning the jobs. Now then the next step is redesigning the skills. So uh, we take retraining of our workers seriously. I mentioned that adult learning and learning on the job is going to be critical in the future. One good thing that uh, our trade union has have been doing is that they are a very progressive trade union. They, they are not the unions you know, going on strike to uh, ask for higher wages because it's, a, it's a just a pure demand, but rather they are unions encouraging workers to learn new skills and work together with the companies to train. And the one step which the unions have done recently is to work on a company training committee which has now evolved in a company training and transformation committee, working together with the businesses to see how the work can be transformed and changed. And with that, I think we should bring the, the workers along. So the future skills, we will need to, be, to train our uh, officers to be much more digitalized, to master the digital skills, to go into areas like, you know, I mentioned about marine tech. And so there are lots of new, uh, technology that are useful, marine tech. If you look at the port operations, a lot of it can be automated. In fact, I think PSA is one of the most automated uh, port operators already. But it can go further with uh, autonomous vehicles in the coming in the future. And when we redesign Tuas port, uh, they will open up even 
newer possibilities. And then, of course, there'll be new skills in the digital area, in dig from digital finance to understanding what green technology is all about. And uh, so it is a very exciting future, but we must prepare for it. I'm glad that the uh, MPA has set up this Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee, and then to also work on the future-ready maritime workforce. So we must equip our people well with the new skills. And you also mentioned about the AFA. In fact, a member of the audience here has been very uh, involved in this setting of AFA, Mr. Tan Chong Ming, who co-led our uh, committee uh, on the Emerging Stronger Task Force with my fellow minister, Desmond Lee. And one key recommendation that came out of that was this AFAs or Alliances for Action. And the Alliance for Action is a very uh, important innovation in Singapore's policy making. In the past, the industry will say, oh, I got these great ideas. Then they, okay, submit for approval. And the regulatory authorities say, no, 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 this won't meet the standards. Sorry, go back and rework, which is a horrible waste of time and resources. So instead, what we are trying to do is to bring the industry together so that um, the industry can set out what the problems are and the agencies can say, well, this is go, no go. And uh, then they work together to come co-create this solution. So everybody buys into that. The other powerful element behind this is that I've said this many, many times that normally when industries are in this, when people are in the same industry, they see each other as competitors. And I think it is good for companies to compete to differentiate yourself. But companies in the same industry will always face the same common problems. So my suggestion is compete to create distinctive edge, but collaborate to solve common problems. And uh, Singapore government and MPA and our agencies will be very happy to work with everyone to solve common challenges. Thank you. Thank you, DPM. Thank you, DPM, very much for the, uh, the maritime lecture, which is fantastic, and the fireside chat. Perhaps I've got myself three key takeaways. One is the maritime industry must transform to grow and decisively tackle the issues of disruption that say DPM it is getting more regular and much more impactful than ever before. Uh, tackle the issues of sustainability as well as efficiency and productivity. And of course, building our future ready talent pool. And I must add here, certainly must include our seafarer community as well. Extremely important for us. The second takeaway I have is time is of the essence. As DPM, as you reminded, we are only one ship generation away to 2050. And here in Singapore, we have an opportunity to really play an even more significant role in the global maritime transformation. Work whole of an industry, tackle common issues, as always, punching above our weight. Yeah. DPM, will you have any final words that you would like to share with our, our audience here today you know, to wrap up the, um, the, your maritime lecture? No, I, I, I know you have a very exciting week ahead, and I really am very happy to see so many of you here gathered today. So as we learn to live with the, uh, the virus, I think we should be looking forward to what next. And uh, I, this is such a unique opportunity for everyone to come together to now you know, exchange ideas, to explore new frontiers. And I would urge everyone to work together to explore new frontiers, including many of you who are on the new frontier of the digital uh, age. You are watching us online, but uh, I have attended so many digital meetings as well. So I think the, uh, that plays a small part in helping us to also reduce the carbon footprint. So, but since those of you who, are, who have flown in here, please enjoy your stay in Singapore and take this opportunity to uh, build deeper relationships with all the players here and identify what are the common issues and the areas for which we can work together and make, another, make many more breakthroughs. Thank you, DPM. Thank you, DPM, for your time, your support, and your words of wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for that insightful conversation. Please stay on stage. We have a token of appreciation to present you. I'd like to invite Chief Executive of MPA, Ms. Kwa Le Hoon, to come on stage and present the token of appreciation. She will first present this token to DPM Heng and next to Mr. Ho. Now these gifts are unique art pieces uh, that can be found in art faculty. It is a platform that maximizes 
The potential and showcases talents of differently abled artists on the autism spectrum. Now, by purchasing their works, we are showing our support uh, in their talents and at the same time, they get to earn royalties and to learn the value of work and financial independence. A very beautiful and meaningful art piece. Now, a token of appreciation um, to Mr. Ho. If you'd like to clap, yes, thank you very much. Applause is a great sound. It's music to the ears. And we will then uh, proceed for a group photo in just a while. To the three on stage, please remove your mask and as we prepare for a group photo taking together, our ushers will help with the art pieces. Miss Kwa, we're going to be taking a group photo together, so you may remove your mask. There will be a mask holder presented to you. And you'll both flank uh, DPN Heng can be in the centre. And big smiles to our cameraman. Wonderful. Thumbs up indeed. A great week ahead. Please put on your mask as you proceed off stage. Indeed, I think we are getting very good at multitasking and uh, posing for photographs in spite and despite that there is measures in place. So thank you very much, to our two gentlemen and Ms. Kwa, for that token of appreciation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as DPM has earlier announced, uh, the launch of the Sea Transport ITM Refresh, as well as the formation of the Maritime Industry Tripartite Transformation Committee, which is a partnership with the industries, unions and government agencies to spearhead the industry transformation of the sea transport sector. So for this, I'd like to invite you to watch a short video on how we envision all this coming together. Let's watch. As the world's busiest container transshipment port, biggest bunkering hub and top international maritime centre, Maritime Singapore is in a strong position, but we have to pedal hard to stay ahead. The sea transport sector is an important enabler of Singapore's global connectivity strategy. It's the forerunner for trade and economic activities in Singapore. The maritime sector is the lifeblood of global trade and a key pillar of Singapore's economy. This creates good jobs, many of which are taken by locals. Sea Transport has remained resilient amidst the challenges of COVID-19, supply chain disruptions, digitalization, and decarbonization. We are turning these challenges into new growth opportunities to attract more business activities, grow the pie, and ultimately benefit Singapore and Singaporeans. The ITM would complement our strategies to grow our global hub port and international maritime centre. It will help us achieve our vision for Singapore as a global maritime hub for connectivity, innovation and talent. So it's very timely that Sea Transport ITM launched four years ago is to account for these new challenges, as well as also capture new opportunities in this whole new backdrop. Over the next five years, digitalization, innovation, sustainability and talent will be key areas of focus. So by 2025, we expect to achieve the vision that we've set out to do. Our areas of focus till then would be First, to build a vibrant, innovative ecosystem to drive competitiveness and new growth areas. Second, to leverage automation and to drive the productivity transformation of the sector. Third, to develop a future-ready maritime workforce equipped with global skill sets. Fourth, to work with partners to support maritime companies to level up their potential as global champions. And finally, to ensure the relevance and resilience of maritime SG as a key node in the global supply chain. Ambitious as it might be, our strategies and targets set out from now till 2025 exemplifies the strong tripartite partnerships in achieving our vision for the sea transport sector and for Maritime Singapore to flourish. 
To support this goal, the Maritime Industry Transformation Tripartite Committee is established to spearhead industry transformation of the sea transport sector. The MITT embodies the close collaborations and partnerships of the government, the industry and the unions working together for the sea transport community. Always looking towards the future as we sail towards the horizon as one maritime Singapore. Well, if you're with us on this vision, please, a round of applause. Together, we are still ahead. Now, Singapore is a global maritime hub for connectivity, innovation and talent. Now, I hope that short video gave you more appreciation of the strategic long-term plans to develop Singapore's next generation port and strengthen our international maritime centre. With that, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of the opening ceremony. I'd now like to take this chance to thank DPM Heng for gracing this event and with him, Minister S. S. Warren for gracing this event as well. Thank you, gentlemen. They will now be taking their leave for the day. If you'd like a warm round of applause to thank them for their presence. DBM Heng and uh, Minister Zwarin make their way through. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we still have a little bit more to our day as we prepare, as you can see behind me, our next segment, the SMW Leaders Perspective. Now, this will be a panel discussion that you can all participate in and I'll share more details with you. It is entitled, Views from the Top, Building the Case for Transformation in Sustainability, Finance and Talent. Now, how you can participate in this segment is to join us on the online interactive Q&A platform called Pigeonhole. So we will now um, just flash the QR code. You could just take your phones out and scan it in. Um, log on, there's a password as well. Or you can always go on to www.pigeonhole.com. And this will allow you to post your questions and participate in this panel discussion. Now to moderate this panel, um, as we prepare this space, I'm very pleased to welcome on stage Vice President of Maritime and Supply Chain Excellence of BHP, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rashpal Bhatti. Please welcome him. Mr. Bhatti, join us on stage. i just like to make a note that this segment will be a mascot segment um, and uh, Mr. Bhatti will be taking over to introduce our panel of speakers. Over to you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, Singapore is undoubtedly the leading international maritime centre uh, of the world. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate Lehun uh, and all of her team for bringing the 16th. I have a very distinguished panel for you to talk about sustainability and the other transformation characteristics that the DPM talked about. So without further ado, I'd like to first of all welcome the chairman of the BW Group, Andreas Soman Pau. Great to see you. You okay there? Then we have the chairman of the Shell Group of Companies in Singapore, Karpeng Or. Welcome. Next we have the global CEO of the One Company, Jeremy Nick. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Paul. And lastly, but definitely not leastly, he's flo flown over from London to grace this occasion. Please welcome 
Stephen Fuster, the Global Head of Shipping Finance at ING Bank. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Please. Good. So we have uh, the best part of about 38 minutes, it says in front of me here, to talk about sustainability, finance and talent. Clearly not time enough, but uh, we will make the best effort to get as much through as uh, many points as possible. And for you all, the objective today, for all the people sitting in this hall and everybody listening virtually, is for us to take away some provocative thought, some seed, some level of thought that you can then take away and collaborate on with the people who you talk to later this week. Before we go there, I just want to take a, a minute because I think it would be remiss of us not to spend 30 seconds to talk about the 1.6 million seafarers who move that 80 to 90% of product around the world. And in these last two years, the DPM talked about it, Minister Isran talked about it, in such conditions that were not conducive. Some of those seafarers have had to stay on board for 14 to 15 months at a time with families who have been suffering back at home in conditions that always haven't been where we would want them to be. Nevertheless, all of those products on our shelves, all the food we wanted, all the products we needed through the pandemic were there accessible to us. Why? because seafarers did not stop doing what they needed to do to keep the global economy moving. May I take this opportunity to ask everybody in this room and everybody watching to put your hands together for the 1.6 million seafarers around the world. Thank you very much for enabling that. Now then, uh, Minister Iswaran and the Deputy Prime Minister talked about the industry requires nothing less than the transformation and the journey that we're on already. The DPM talked about a tectonic shift in geopolitics. He talked about three areas of transformation, higher rates and the possibility of excessive investment, but may cause a glut in shipping. He talked about the reliability of vessels arriving at ports has halved and the opportunity to improve efficiency is large. He then also talked about the decarbonisation challenge and the short-term headwinds, but a very, very strong foundation that lays ahead of us. He talked about resilience. He talked about the characteristic that's required for us to move forward and make that challenge something that is a challenge of the past so that we can look forward to a decarbonisation to a carbon-free shipping industry. One billion tonnes we've got to abate in the shipping industry, ladies and gentlemen. One billion tonnes. Two to three percent of the world's uh, emissions. Let's not talk about 2050. Let's talk about the next five years. What needs to happen now? What needs to happen to accelerate the decarbonisation journey? Let me pose that question first of all to Andres. So a lot of actions have to happen now, but we also have to realize that they will take time to, to mature. So they, they won't all be here in five years, but we have to start now working on them. And the three big paths, which many of you will be familiar with, one is take CO2 out of traditional fuels. And so CCS needs to be tackled, uh, which allows us to, to use traditional fuels. The second one is biofuels. And that's a question of availability and cost, but also traceability. And the third big path is new fuels, which is also about availability and cost. Uh, but there are a lot of practical aspects around safety and handling. And that's one of the things that GCMD, the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization, is very keen to work on, which is let's not only talk about them at the theoretical level, but let's get our hands on gaps and practical steps that propel this journey forwards. Thank you, Andreas. Karpeng, you have a fantastic vantage point, I would say, 
at the helm of uh, the Shell group of companies in Asia. How do you think we can accelerate this program? Well, I, you know, first I, I do think that we have to make our ambition very transparent and not just commit to it for 2050, but bring it much nearer term. So for us, we said, look, by 2030, we want to halve our own emissions in, in this country, and that's massive. That's two and a half million tons, maybe closer to three, I would say, of carbon abatement by the end of this decade. So I think making your, your um, ambition transparent is, is one, but then turning it into action is another one. We've already cut half the amount of crude that we're processing in Singapore. But then, you know, when you start talking about building new supply chains, supply chains that are needed for biofuels, for example, that's not a small challenge. Now, that supply chain does exist in some ways already, whether you're talking about collecting waste oil, waste animal fat, they, th these supply chains do exist, but not at the scale that we need. So for us, the question is how do we bring our ambition, our very near-term ambition, take the supply chains that exist and then massively and rapidly scale. The, the third thing I want to also talk about is, you know, when we say that we are looking at new fuels and yes, there will be multiple pathways for decarbonization, we need to look beyond fuels as well. We need to look at all the technologies that will enable efficiencies today, technologies like fuel cell that will work with various types of fuel and, and therefore look at it as energy and not just fuel. Mm. So increasingly, you know, we want you, all of you here to think of Shell as an energy company, not just an oil or a gas or, or you know, well, call us what you will, but we are an energy company. So I think we do have to then look beyond fuels at the broader range of technology that's available to all of us. And let's not forget, there are solutions available today. LNG is available today. We've spent the last seven, eight years investing to build infrastructure all, all around the world, including in Singapore, to enable the bunkering of LNG. That's already going to cut GHG by, what, a quarter? Indeed. Compared to existing fuels. Indeed. And, you know, we used to say, well, LNG is a transition fuel, but I think it's a fuel in transition. Because you've got to think about that beyond today to say, what is the future going to look like if you can get to bio LNG, you can get to synthetic LNG. So, I, you know, I, I think there are possibilities That's right. that are available even today that we cannot say we will not indeed, take advantage of. Indeed. LNG is indeed a fuel in transition. Now then, Jeremy, with that, all that said, you have the vantage point of being one of the largest uh, container liners in, in the world, millions of TUs, and you have the responsibility of not only doing that at the lowest cost safely, uh, delivering social value around it, but the world is also looking towards you to say, how are you going to do that by abating as much carbon as possible? What are your thoughts? Well, indeed, Rashpal, and uh, the world is looking at us to do this uh, as, as shipping. Uh, our customers are very, very much pushing us. Uh, I think our staff, our management, our stakeholders uh, all want to uh, decarbonize the world. But it's, it's the practical realities of that. So we, we see... Uh, Methanol ordered ships uh, just being made now. Uh, ammonia ready ships just being made now. Uh, the key thing though is to make sure that we have enough green fuel available three to four years out. So when those ships come off the production line and other orders will hopefully be made in the next six to nine months that we have at least the start of real green fuel which links us back frankly to, to green hydrogen is, is what the key building block will be. So we just take the Deputy Prime Minister's figure of 100,000 vessels out there, and the ship takes 25 years on average over its working lifetime, then reality is that uh, we need to start replacing green ship, creating green ships and ordering green ships and delivering green ships, probably about 4% a year. So that's 4,000 vessels a year to come out of the shipyards on a continuous, sustainable basis for the next 25 years. So that means ordering, 
manufacturing and delivering and having the green fuel ready. And to do that, uh, it means, of course, that the rest of the, the fleet, so in year one, 4% is converted to green fuel. The other 96 is still running on carbon fuels. Those 96%, as, as Andres has rightly pointed out, if we can get some carbon capture in there to try and help some of those reduce their carbon footprint, that's great. But the reality is that we're going to need market-based measures, and we're going to need incentives to accelerate the availability of that green fuel and to make sure those orders are coming through at that 4% level each year. And to do that, we need to have some kind of levy, some levy on bunker fuel, which probably initially in the first year needs to be about $30 a ton uh, across all fuels. So the 96% pay the, the $30, and then that money is then collected, and that then comes back as a rebate or some form to level up the other, uh, just the 4% that are already running on the green fuel. So this is where we're getting to the real practicalities. We're having to make and commit to orders in our boardrooms, make financing with our banks, working with the energy companies. We've really got to start doing that now as an industry to get that 4% changeover happening year on year going forward as soon as possible. Fantastic. There's a, a plan laid out already for us. And if I may take that point that you just made, Jeremy, and throw over to Stephen, because the question has just come through. I'm not sure if we can put it up on the screen here, which I think is very appropriate. Uh, where, uh, Stephen, this question is for you. Where are the biggest sources of green financed funding today, and how can Maritime tap into them? So uh, bridging what Jeremy just talked about, the enablement needs to come by way of levy, perhaps, but also through green financing. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I certainly agree with Jeremy on the need for, for market-based measures. And I, think, I think most of us probably would do. You know, we have to make um, the carbon fuels at least as expensive as the, as the sustainable fuels. Um, but coming more to the question, I think you know, what we need um, in the financial industry is greater transparency. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that for... For many, many years, we've been taking lending decisions based on financial information, so based on credit risk, not asset risk. And what we need, and what we're now starting to get, and the Poseidon Principles has been one of the great contributors to this, what we're now getting is underlying performance, uh, sorry, underlying data on vessels' performance. And we can now use that data that we get to not necessarily offer green finance per se, because actually to get ship finance qualifying as green is really incredibly difficult right, right now. If you look at the EU taxonomy, you can't really get a shipping loan to qualify as green. But what we can do is to offer financial incentives to owners to reduce their carbon emissions. So what many of the banks are offering, including ING, is what we call sustainability linked loans. So we will measure your um, environmental performance uh, on day one, and if you continue to improve and largely follow the IMO pathway, then you can expect a reduction in your interest rate margin. Now, if you, if you don't um, perform in line with that pathway, then you can also expect a penalty that your interest margin will go up. Now, this is becoming an increasingly common uh, product that banks are offering. The, the challenge we have is that that interest margin comes out of our own profit line, which, which is fine, but really what we want to see is bank regulators agreeing to lower capital weightings mm. for the greener assets. And we haven't yet got that, but I hope that we will do going forward. Can I just challenge that for a moment? You know, the, because sustainability link loans are fantastic, but they're 10 basis points, 20 basis points. It's a nudge, which is great and, and important. But how do we get finance to really move the needle on things that are a little bit riskier or where actually uh, debt cost has to come down more significantly? You know, how, how do you see finance playing a role in a bigger nudge? Well, in terms of the, the margin, that's where we really need uh, the bank regulators to get on side. 
because at the end of the day, you know, one of our major financial metrics is return on equity. And if we can allocate lower equity against the loan, then we can afford to offer a greater margin reduction. So I think that's the, uh, perhaps the major thing. And I've forgotten the second part of your question, Andreas. <laughs> no, I think that was just how, how do we create bigger impetus for the finance sector yeah. to, to, to finance risk, riskier things? You, you've answered one is the regulatory no. framework. Well, I think, um, I'm sorry, that, that was a very good question. And I think what we need is, and you will hear this term, and you have heard this term many times already, we need greater collaboration. Now, what banks are able to do is to take credit risk, but we're not re really able to take innovation risk. And what we really need is to allocate the risks in a transaction where the technology is perhaps unproven. We need to allocate those risks to the parties who are best able to take them. So banks don't want to take operating risk or technical risk. We'll take the credit risk, but those other risks have to be allocated. Now, I would say that the technology risk should really go to the shipyards and the engine manufacturers, and there has to be some kind of performance guarantee that if the ship doesn't perform according to the specs, you know, they're at risk for that. The operating risk should really lie with the ship owner themselves. They have to demonstrate that they're able to operate the ships with this new technology, and the banks take the credit risk. So really, it's a sharing of risks with those parties who are best able to manage them. I, I think that's right. It's a sharing of risks, both from an equity and interest perspective. Let's, um, there's a question that's coming. Thank you very much for the questions that are coming from the audience. I'd much rather that uh, you carry on bringing in those questions uh, and we can ask those questions that come in on the live portal, because that also means that you know that uh, the questions haven't been set up earlier with, with answers from the panel. So you'll be getting answers that are, uh, are right here and right now. So that question that's just come in uh, and has got a number of votes, this is for you, Jeremy. Um, with all the focus on sustainability transition, why are there still owners ordering new ships running on HFO and scrubbers? To your point about the 4% move per annum. Yeah, th thank you, Rashpal. Um, because in reality, right now, in terms of real green fuel, uh, as in, you know, methanol, uh, green hydrogen, ammonia, that, that there isn't available, uh, en enough of that available at scale. So really, uh, you have a number of options when you're ordering ships right now. One, of course, is to go LNG, which we understand the, the, the logic behind that. And with, with the view that over time, hopefully we can get to green LNG and therefore you can keep maintain the existing asset and you can change the fuel type over. Um, the, the second one is to go straight away for a, a dual fuel scenario where you could burn methanol like Maersk is doing and actually procuring the whole supply chain upstream as well to get to get the methanol, which I think is a, a, an amazing uh, uh, feat and uh, they are to be congratulated on that. But not everybody's in that situation. And the, the, set, the third way is to, is to build an asset which initially is probably going to use fuel oil, but which could be converted over, retrofitted, within two, three, four years when the new green fuels become available. So you know how you're going to run it on methanol, you know how you're going to run it on ammonia, and uh, therefore you've designed the vessel, the tanks, the safety system, so that as soon as that uh, becomes available at scale, you can then take the ship back into the shipyard and retrofit it so that it can then be converted for the rest of its life uh, to, to run on the green fuel. So those are the, really the three scenarios. And that's why right now there aren't so many orders. Um, and we need to create this market-based measures. And we need to, the green fuels to come forward. And we need the shipyards to be able to, to build green ships at scale in terms of the number of ships we can produce each year. And then you know, I think we're going to get towards that quite soon, I hope. Uh, but that's what's really needed. Thank you. Andres, I, I'm so glad that uh, Jeremy used this word reality at the beginning of his comment <laughs> because I think what we've done really well over the past couple of years is aspirations. And we've set these aspirations for 2050 and <clears throat> the aspirations are so important in setting the direction of where we want to go. But you cannot solve a problem 
if you don't know uh, or you're unwilling to face what the reality is. And Jeremy was alluding to um, the reality of, of these new fuels not being available today. I mean, the reality is that these new fuels need renewables. And the reality is that you need four times the capex to produce wind versus gas. And the reality is you need uh, four to five times the amount of minerals and materials to produce solar PV cells than you need to power off gas. And we've lulled ourselves into this idea that we have the solutions because, you know, the politicians have told us, haven't they, that gas, uh, the, the wind and solar are cheaper than everything else. And that's only true if you don't want it 24 hours a day. And so we're in this sort of state of complacency. Why not just switch off uh, building ships with traditional fuels? Well, then goods won't flow around the world because there isn't enough ammonia and hydrogen and, and biofuels and so on. So I think it's really important. The, 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 just one more, more point of this. I think that we've also been lulled into complacency because a lot of these improvements we've seen, which have been fantastic, have been because of cheap energy, cheap money, and free trade under global peace, you know, Pax Americana or whatever you, you, people call it. Um, and I think these are all reversing. You know, energy is getting more expensive. Um, minerals and, and metals are getting more expensive. Money is getting more expensive. And the free trade is not quite as easy as it used to be. And so we just have to be, we have to be realistic. Okay. I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, but be realistic for now. Loud into you know, a full sense of security. Loud and Energy clear, right? That, that realities are realities. And, and, you know, every morning you wake up, you look at what's real around you. It seems to get more and more difficult and more and more harsh. Um, so completely agree with that. I think there is still a question of, so given all the realities, what's going to change? How's, how's our approach going to change to not potentially not looking for a single pathway and saying, let's find the perfect green fuel of the future and say, what are the different pathways we have to explore to get there? And there will be multiple pathways. If nothing else, you know, the, the energy security debate that is now raging is telling us we need diversity of options, right? You need to have the agility and the willingness and the capacity to build multiple pathways. And, and I'm discovering that even in our organization that, yes, you can think of all the possibilities, but it's also the capacity of the organization to then make those changes real that sometimes, you know, kind of gets in the way. So, so I'm with you. Second point I want to make is what can, you know, governments, and this was something that Stephen made a, po a point about earlier, what can governments as well as international organizations do to help bring about the environment whether it's true regulations, standard setting, ambition setting, you know, coordination of all kinds of um, uh, uh, issues, what can they do more actively to try and support and help drive that change um, uh, so, so that, you know, we can all go and say, yes, that's the reality, but, you know, we are going to still move forward. I guess, Kaopeng, I, I agree. The, the fact of the matter is that the people who are going to make that change are sitting in this room. And Stephen, your thoughts? Well, I wanted to come back on a point that, that Jeremy made um, about you know, building ships to change engines in three, four years. Um, you know, at the moment, we, we design and build ships to last 25 years, and they're not designed to have their major components swapped out. And I think what we need to do as an industry, we need to change the way we design and build ships. Mm. So we need to, to build more modular ships where we can swap parts in and out easily. So plug and play. And I think if we can do that, then we can develop financing around that. If you look at the aviation industry, um, the airframes and the engines are often financed separately. That doesn't happen in shipping at all. But why can't we get to a point whereby we build a, a ship today with conventional engines, which can easily be swapped out in three or four years' time and can be financed separately? 
you know, why do we feel that we, we can't do that today? And it's simply because we don't design ships to achieve that. Okay. So I think so, we really need to change the way we design and build ships. Stephen, that's a great point. That's a challenge to all those out there who are naval architects and uh, working with shipyards and operators. Let's make our ships more component-based and modularized so that we don't have to take a 25-year view. And just as a, um, as a follow-up to Carpeng's point, you know, realism doesn't mean being despondent or pessimistic or depressed. Um, human beings are amazing. I mean, we've done amazing things through hard work and incremental progress. And I think what scares me right now is the number of people who think we can just flick a switch and just turn this off and, and do this, and it's all going to be easy. And I think what we have to say is we're going to get there, we're going to solve this problem, but it's going to take really hard work and it's going to take incrementalism. So let's start now and take these, these pathways, but nothing to be depressed about, just be realistic. Absolutely. Now then, we are quickly moving through this from a time point of view. There's one question here that I really want the panel to answer uh, in the, on the same vein, or in the same vein. It's from Jan Christoph. Thank you for your question. What is the single most important step to reach zero carbon shipping? A very short answer, answer from each of you, please. Jeremy? I, I would say uh, get the regulation in place, but the most critical part is to produce enough green hydrogen for the shipping industry. Andres? So you said the single most what? The single most important step to reach zero carbon shipping. I'm going to uh, decline to give a single step because I think this challenge is too complex and too important to boil it down to a, a single step. It's, uh, Come on, Andreas. One out of your kitty of many areas that you I need mean, to I think then I'll, I'll echo Jeremy. Yeah. It's, it's money. I mean, f finance, um, carbon tax, whatever you call it, is critical to unlock because these gaps are too big today. Um, but I, I really would emphasize again, it's not about single switches, it's not about single steps, it's about doing a hundred, a yes. thousand things uh, Noted. that Noted. will incrementally get us there. Absolutely. Okay. I'm completely with Andreas here. I will not answer this question <laughs> <laughs> because there is no single important step. If we all believe that we can get there, if we took that one single step, I'm not there yet. So let's ask the question differently. It will be a multitude of steps uh, that will come together, and there might be four or five here. What would one of them into that group of steps be for you? Well, I, you know, putting a price on carbon is a big step. Yeah. And how does this price of carbon exist for international shipping? Excellent. Stephen? Well, I agree with uh, my fellow panelists. I don't think there's one single step and of course you know one step will hopefully lead to another step that's that's kind of what a step means um you know i can only really talk on the finance side and of course without finance there are no new buildings so i think that the banks have a very important role to play in all of this uh, which is why we introduced the poseidon principles almost three years ago at the time poseidon principles was criticized because it was felt it was too ambitious it's now being criticised because it's not ambitious enough. And I think that I agree with that. And I think you should expect to see that the Poseidon principles will become more ambitious. And it will become more transparent. We'll be asking banks to report different figures rather than just the IMO figure. So we may well be asking you to report on a zero by 2050 pathway. And we may well be asking you to report on an absolute carbon figure because, of course, the AER is a relative score. And I think if we can do that, that will help focus the mind as to where the finance is directed, and that in turn will be a big step. So, Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to move on now because we're running out of time very quickly. The second topic that I want to broach today is talent. Um, so the first que th this question goes to Karpeng. Uh, how are your recruiting practices changing, and how will talent be sourced differently over the next five years? Oh, there are so many things you need to do on talent, right? I mean, if I just look out at this room, 
talent can get more diverse, e even from a, just a simple gender point of view. Um, but a, a couple of things on, on, on how we're changing the way we think about talent. First, it's got to be broad-based talent. We can't just say, hey, we're an engineering company, you know, we need a lot of engineers and science-based graduates. Yes, we still need all of those, but recruiting broad-based means that we believe that many people with many different types of backgrounds mm. can bring perspectives and ways of thinking that will help solve a very complex problem. So we are recruiting across the board, doesn't matter whether you have a STEM education or not, completely across the board. So I think that's one. But you know, much more than just recruiting, I think the question is how do you develop them? You know, when, when they join a, a large company like Shell, what do we do with them? How do you make sure that while they are building the expertise and the depth that they will need, you are at the same time giving them exposure across the board? And, you know, and when I say across the board, even in Shell, that's across a very, very big board. So how do we create opportunities for them to rapidly get that exposure both internally and externally, and build what I think in the Singapore government, they will say, you know, you're, you're not looking for just peaks of excellence, but you're looking for the T-shaped talent, right? You're looking for somebody who's got both the breadth as well as over time, the depth and the experience. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And I think the third part of it is really, how do you create an environment where the networking and the thinking of how they go about that is part and parcel mm. of saying that, you know, I, I can not only do my job well, but I got to reach out. You know, in a, in a collaborative world, you have to really build that network consciously, not just because you need to progress your, <laughs> your career, but know that to solve complex problems, that network is going to come in all the time. So just a Thank couple you, of Tom. dimensions to share. Indeed. Now, Stephen, uh, uh, you come from an industry which, if I may call it traditional in, in thought, perhaps uh, banking and finance is changing, of course. But I know that you have some quite strong views on talent and how we can think about this differently. How long have I got? <laughs> um, Two minutes. Yeah, look, I mean, banks have traditionally recruited graduates coming out of you know, red brick universities. Uh, often with degrees which are totally relevant to the jobs that they're going to do. Uh, and I think, you know, what we're trying to do now is to change that. We want to, to bring in people with a much broader and diverse background because diversity does undoubtedly lead to, to better quality decisions because there's greater challenge in the process. So I think that's one thing we can do. But in terms of, of the maritime industry, I think we have a lot of PR to do. You know, when we see people coming into the bank at you know, 21, 22, straight out of university, none of them want to come into shipping finance. We're seen as a boring, staid, dull industry. They all want to go into infrastructure or leverage finance, all the things that they think are sexy. Yeah. Those ones who, who are unfortunate to, come in, unfortunate to come into shipping against their will, actually when they get here, they love it and they rarely want to leave. So we need to promote shipping as a forward-thinking industry because that's what we are. We need to show them that we're embracing technology because, again, we are. And I think if we can do those things, then we can get real good, high-quality candidates into the industry. Fantastic, Stephen. Thank you very much.